Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We give you glory. We give you praise for tonight. Thank you for the gift of life. Holy Spirit divine, I ask the Lord you will have your way and you speak to our hearts. And your word will have an inroad into our spirit and into our lives. And our lives will never be the same again. And your lives will be transformed. And your name will be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, um, we go into chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. And it's been quite a journey. Um, last week, we learned about what seals a covenant. And um, two things we learned why God is a covenant keeping God that is bound by his promise and by his oath. Two immutable things. And so when we make a covenant with God, we should understand that God cannot break his covenant and he will bring it surely to what? To pass. Tonight, um, we're going to learn about the priesthood of Christ. The priesthood of Christ. The priesthood of Christ. And you will notice that through, as we go through the book of Hebrews, it mirrors the things and the activities of the Old Testament. And so you have to have a very good grasp of the Old Testament to understand what the writer is saying in the New Testament. But there's a lot to learn, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to help us to understand, especially in a time where the church, the two extremes of the church, one that believes that everything must be done by the law, and another one that believes that everything is grace and there is no, nothing to check you at all because you live under the grace, you can do whatever you like. Once you give your life to Christ, you can do whatever you like. As we look at scripture, scripture will answer those questions. And so I want you to pick up your pen, pick up your notebook and begin to write things down. Hebrews is a book also for those that want to grow. And I keep warning, but there are days that are coming that the depth of the knowledge and the revelation you have about Christ Jesus will determine how effectively you can stand. And so understanding Christ, knowing Christ from the pages of the scriptures and by revelation is essential in the days in which we live. And before I delve into the message, um, I just want to admonish the church that um, this is a time I know we are approaching Christmas and um, human nature during Christmas we spend overboard. We just spend and eat and eat and forget that there's a man called January and there's a man called February. You cannot afford to do that in this season. Spread yourself well. In fact, from now, begin to make plans. Begin to make plans to use your money effectively and also do shopping wisely. Buy those things that are necessary and things that you can store. The Bible says there were prophets in the early church. One of them was called Agabus. And Agabus received a word from the Lord and let the apostles know that there was famine coming. And the famine will be concentrated in the region of Judea. And so the brothers and the sisters that were in and around Jerusalem need to be warned. And they also took 
offerings to be able to have a storage for food. There are difficult days that are ahead. That's all I can tell you. There are difficult days that are ahead. Please pay attention, take caution, and plan well. And plan well. It's not everything we can go into details of, but I can forewarn you that difficult days are ahead. And when Joseph had a dream, when the Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph interpreted the dream, he didn't just sit there and not do anything about the dream. He woke up and did something about the dream. They planned strategically. They didn't only what? Pray. They planned strategically. That's just by the way. Now let's go into the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham just gave... Just verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And this man called Melchizedek, you could call him Melchizedek or Melchizedek, it all depends on the language, from language perspective in which you want to speak and how you want to pronounce the name. You will also notice that the spelling of the name sometimes ends with a C and sometimes ends with a K. That's because when it ends with a K, it was translated from Hebrew, and when it ends with a C, it was translated from Greek. The, the Greeks spell it with C ending, and don't be so um, worked up about the spelling of names. I know in the generation in which we live, we're so particular about the spelling of names and, and the pronunciation of names and all kinds of pettiness, you know? Um, it's, it's the same name. Stephen spelled with a V is the same Stephen spelled with a PH. Um, one is of an English um, um, intonation and the other one is of a Greek intonation. And then by the time you get to Russia, it will not be said, it will not be called Stephen anymore because Stefanovic and um, language and linguistics affects the spelling of names and the intonation of names. For example, in the Caribbean, you pronounce the name and say Isaac. If you go to other parts of the world, nobody pronounces it as Isaac. I am cross culture, so I know the differences in how people pronounce names. It's not pronounced Isaac. When you go to certain cultures, it jolly is pronounced Isaac. And so there are derivatives of names. Yet, same name, if you go into the, um, the Middle Eastern countries, they don't pronounce it Isaac. They don't pronounce it Isaac. They pronounce it Isaac. They pronounce it Isaac. And they don't, they don't they, 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 the S is pronounced as a, as a Z. So names and pronunciations of names is not something um, that is very important that we should fight over. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now, this Melchizedek is a very mysterious person. Mysterious in the sense that the Bible does not give us a lot of information concerning him. There's not a lot of information concerning him. We are told he was a king. And we are told he was a priest. And we are told he was the priest of the Most High God. But we don't know who his father was. We don't know who his mother was. And yet, when Abraham went to war and won the war, he met him and decided to give tithes to this man. And the Bible said this man blessed him. So now Abraham was a patriarch. Abraham was a prophet in his own right. So for this man to bless him, that means this man was higher up spiritually than Abraham. And for Abraham to give him tithes, this man was higher up. Now there's a fight in Christianity as to who 
Melchizedek is. Now, I for one, I'm not interested in all this pettiness because as far as I'm concerned, it's like the disciples of Jesus fighting and saying that it's because we did not buy bread. Jesus said, be careful of the, um, of the living of the Pharisees and they, they, they concluded that it's because he didn't buy bread. <laughs> they missed the point. But that did not make them um, unbelievers because they miss what? misunderstood what he said. And you will have derivatives of explanations concerning certain matters in the Bible that has nothing to do with where a man will spend eternity. It has nothing to do with how effective you serve God. It has nothing to do with your love for God and your love for his service and things like that. And so we shouldn't work ourselves up. But I'll still let you know the different understandings of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek shows traits that only Christ Jesus has. For example, we are told he was a king of what? The king of Salem. Now, Salem was an actual city. It, Salem later on will become Jeru what? Salem. So it was an actual city and he was the king of the city. Now, and then we are told he is the priest of the most high world, most high God. Now, all throughout the Old Testament, God did not trust men to be priests and kings at the same time. It was prophecy, but then it was through Christ we had access to become kings and what? To become kings and priests. That's why you read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, ye are what? A royal what? priest. We are royalty kings and at the same time priesthood. Now, I wanted to read Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and say, write the scripture down because it's not in the nose. Revelation chapter 1, verse, in fact, start from 4 to 6. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. Yes, continue. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and have made us kings and priests unto God. And so Jesus have made us kings and priests unto God, his father. We are priests and kings, because he himself is a king of kings, and he himself is the high priest. As we study the chapter, you will notice Christ is our heart. He's our high priest. And he's our king. Because he's the king of kings. Now, why will Jesus be called king of kings? He's king of kings because you are a king. Say, I am a king. It's just that we don't behave like kings. We don't think like kings. But we are kings because he's the king of what? Of kings. He is the king of kings. And so this personality called Mel Melchizedek had um, both aspects of being a king and being what? And being a priest. Now, I want us to read another scripture that prophesies about Melchizedek. Go to Psalm 110 verse 4. Psalm 110 verse 4. Someone, Lord, yes, go ahead. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is prophecy about Jesus. Thou art a priest for how long? Forever in the order, in the manner, in the similitude of what? Melchizedek. Now, why in the manner of Melchizedek? Because the priesthood of Melchizedek allowed him to be king and priest. The priesthood of Leviticus only allows you to be what? A priest. And your priesthood ends. Your priesthood do not continue forever. Your priesthood ends because you die and another person comes and another high priest comes. Now, you see, understanding the language of the prophetic, God speaks in prophetic languages and there are two um, terminologies, I'm going to take my time to explain. One is called typology, 
and one is called Christophany. You can write them down. One is typology, and one is Christophany. Christophany is where certain parts of the Old Testament, Jesus showed up, and then after he showed up, he then had an interaction with human beings, and then he vanished. For example, we know in Genesis chapter 18 that he had interactions with Abraham, and then after that word, he left. And so that is what you call a theophany. And it's also called a Christophany, Christ manifesting himself in the form of man in the season of the Old Testament. And then you have what is called typology, where his life, his prophecy, a human being lives the life of Christ that mimics what will happen to the life of Christ. Now, I'll give you a practical example. For example, look at the life of um, Joseph. Joseph is a typology of Jesus in the sense that he had a dream. He shared his dream with his brethren, and his brethren hated him for the dream. And then when you look at the life of Jesus, he went to the synagogue. They gave him a book to read. And then he read the prophecy and said, this day is this scripture one fulfilled in your ears. Now, the next thing is people should be clapping and say, yay, finally the Messiah is here and everything, yay. No, they hated him for that. They didn't love him for that. They hated him for that. Just the same thing that happened to what? Joseph. Now, Joseph was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was, um, went through all kinds of trouble. Jesus went through all kinds of trouble. And then when finally he was released out of prison for interpreting the dream of um, Pharaoh, he was given new robes. And when he was given new robes, he was given an Egyptian wife to what? To marry. Well, then when you look at Christ, Christ came into the world. He was given a Gentile wife just as Joseph too was given what? A Gentile wife. And then his very presence in the land of Egypt preserved the life of other people. The very presence of Jesus preserved our lives. And so you will see that Joseph lived his life. But the pathway of his life and what happened in his life is a typology of the life of Jesus. And then you take the life of Isaac. When you take the life of Isaac, his father Abraham took him to Mount Moriah, sacrificed him as the only son. Now, it is in the same region, Mount Moriah forms part of Golgotha where Jesus was what? Was crucified. And so Abraham took his only promised son there to, crucify, um, to kill him. And the father also had planned to crucify his only begotten son in the same what? In the same place. And so when you see these pictures and the lives of other people, you'll notice that these are typologies of the life of what? Of Christ. But Christophany is when he shows in his full presence and a person experienced that this, of indeed this is the son of God, but they did not know his name. They knew that they have encountered God, but they did not know his name. That is a theophany or a Christophany. Now, when it comes to the issue of Melchizedek, there are two divergent views and there are reasons for why there are divergent views. And the reason is, the people that believe that the life of Melchizedek is a typology in the sense that his priesthood was like unto the priesthood of Christ. It's a likelihood. It's not the exact. There's a truth in that. And those that say that, well, but the Bible says that he doesn't have any father and he doesn't have what? Any mother. So if he doesn't have any father and he doesn't have any mother, what kind of human being he was? He couldn't. Every human being is born of a woman. How come he didn't have a father and what? A mother. So we believe 
that he was actually Christ manifested. And, um, but there are evidences that shows that he could have been just a natural human being that, uh, that lived just that. His lifestyle and everything mimicked that of the Christ that was to what? That was to come. That's also possible. Why is that possible? I'm going to show you a scripture. Go to Joshua. Joshua chapter 10. And I want you to read from verse 1 to 4. Joshua chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem. Adonai Zedek. So we know that there were, as the, the Zedeks were a title that were given to kings in that region. Just the same way that Pharaoh was a title that was given to any king of Egypt. I hope you understand that the, the Pharaoh that interpreted, um, Joseph interpreted his dream, is not the Pharaoh that kicked them out of uh, Egypt. And um, it's not the Pharaoh that other um, kings of Israel encountered, but it was a title. Just the same way in the Roman Empire, the title of um, Caesar. Caesar was a title. And Herod was a title. So, for example, the Herod that made the law that all babies should be killed is not the Herod that turned into worms. So, these are kingship what? Titles that you hold. Once you sit on the throne, your name is changed to Herod. Now, you have to read history to make the distinctions of the times and the seasons these Herods, these Caesars, and these Pharaohs, and these Zedeks came. Now, the Bible said there was Adonai Zedek, who was king of what? Jerusalem. Now, we are also told in Genesis that, and we are told in Hebrews, that there was a man called Melchizedek Zedek. So it is possible that he was a man. It is well possible. Now, I've always held the view of Christophany that, yes, Melchizedek for sure had to be Christ manifested. But studying this thing again, it is possible that he was a human being. He was just a typology of what? Of Christ. So we have to bear that in mind. Now, Adonizedek, read on. King of Jerusalem. I read it them again. I'm saving my tongue. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, <laughs> king of Jerusalem, yes. had heard how Joshua had taken Ai mm -hmm. and utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king. So he had done to Ai and her king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than I, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lashish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me, that we may smite Gibeon for it have made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. You can stop there. So you, you will notice that Adon Adonai Zedek was actually a person. So if Adonai Zedek was a person, it is possible Melchizedek Zedek was also one, a person. But you see, God chooses who he chooses. The gift and calling of God is without one. Is without repentance. I mean, when you look at God's way of choosing people, you know, sometimes humans think that they know better than God. Why will God choose that person and use him? That's your problem. God, when God sets his eyes on people, he sets his eyes on people. From, from, from an intellectual point of view and a natural point of view, when Jonah said he was not going to go to Nineveh, come on, God could have found another person to go to what? Nineveh. What, why, why, why Jonah? Why must it be Jonah? If Jonah says he's not going, find another person. Now, me and you would have done that. You, you don't want to go? We'll find another person well, to go. But God has already set his eyes that it's Jonah that will do the job. 
And so he locked him up in the belly. And then he began to pray. And then he resurrected him and brought him back. And the Bible said, and the word of the Lord came back to Joshua saying, go to Nineveh. The same preaching message you didn't want to do is still there. That's why you can't run away from calling. You cannot. If you run away from calling, it will mess you up. So God in his sovereignty would have chosen this person to mimic Christ. It is possible. Now, let me give you another scripture. Go to Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. Hosea 12.10 I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. Just verse 10. Read Hosea chapter 12 verse 10 slowly. I have also spoken by the prophets. I have also spoken by the prophets. And I have multiplied visions. Now, dimensions of the prophets, prophetic. One, he spoke to the prophet. The word of the Lord came to the prophets. Okay, that's one. Two. And I have multiplied visions. God speaks by multiplication of what? Visions. Three. And use similitudes. And use similitudes. Now, things that looks like to bring a message what? across so it is the pathings of god it is the patterns of god now that is why if you want to grow spiritually you need to be observant you need to pay attention any of us just don't pay attention to anything at all today i was just meditating and thinking of and i realized something that i have not paid attention to everything god created has a dimension for our very survival on this earth everything everything on this earth has an assignment to accomplish but because we are busy people moving and going and coming we don't pay attention to these things and we think they're just there and everything for example even plants there are plants that are specifically created for even your spiritual growth that will surprise you what do we use olive oil for it anoints priests, it anoints kings, it anoints prophets, and it's just a, a product of what? A tree. So the things he created, they have physical uses and they have spiritual connotations what? to it, and that when we pay attention to scripture, we will find them. They are all in the Bible. It's just that we don't pay attention. And so God likes to use similitudes and um, by the ministry of the prophets. So the prophetic ministry, you have to pay attention to the word of God and you have to pay attention to your surroundings. You have to pay attention to your surroundings. Jeremiah, get up, go to the potter's house. And he gets out and go to the potter's house and he tells him, I'm the potter, the nation is declared. And so if you're somebody that don't pay attention, there's always looking for a vision, you will not get what God wants to tell you because he may want to talk to you in similitude. He, Jeremiah hardly received visions, but he had a lot of the word of the Lord came to him and similitude. Whereas Isaiah, abundance of visions, and Daniel, abundance of visions. So you need to even know what kind of nature of prophetic God has called you to all of that, the detail. You need to pay attention to that. But let me leave that there. Go to Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 20. Genesis 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and of earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now, that is very interesting. So the Bible said Abraham goes to war. And after the war, he has all these booties and all these goodies he got from winning the war. Met this man called Melchizedek, who is a king of Salem. 
and also the priests of the Most High God. And the man blesses Abraham. And then he brings nothing but bread and wine. And so communion is not a New Testament phenomenon. It started way before the law. And Abraham, and I showed you last week that the gospel was first preached to who? To Abraham, not us. The gospel was first preached to Abraham. And Abraham was justified by faith and not by, by the law. The law came by Moses. Abraham was justified by faith and it was counted unto him what? For righteousness. And in the same way we are saved, we are saved by grace through what? Through faith. Saved by grace through faith. Nothing else. Saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by the law. I repeat, the law cannot save anybody. The law is a schoolmaster, and I'll show you in scripture. But now I just wanted to point things out to you that he gave tithes of all. Which is very interesting. Who taught Abraham to give tithes? Who was Abraham's pastor? And uh, you have to understand that the Levitical order had not been established yet. Um, Aaron had not become the high priest yet. The Levites have not started yet. The tabernacle had not been built yet. They were still, they haven't even got to Egypt at all. But Abraham knew right from the realms of the spirit that everything God blesses you, you take a tithe of it. And this is an example that tithing has nothing to do with the law. It's got nothing to do with the law. So you cannot be saying, but I, I want Abraham, Abraham blessings. I want to claim Abraham blessings. I want to have all the prosperity of Abraham, but I don't want the consecration of Abraham. Which is a phony. And that's what's happening in the last days because people don't understand. But if you watch and look at the life of Abraham, that's not all he did. He didn't only give tithes and leave it there. He moved on and he gave a lot. Abraham was a giver. And so the lifestyle of Abraham, if we also are the children of Abraham through Christ, then we should emulate him and be givers. Amen. That's verse. Verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham. No, I mean, next verse in Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 2. Verse 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by the interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Read, on verse, read verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, the Bible tells us that Abraham gave a tenth of all that he had to Melchizedek, who was a king and who was a priest. And I've already explained how he was not without father, and without what? Without mother. But then, um, if you go into biblical history, you will find out that one of the, um, the Greek New Testament put it this way, that without any um, record of his mother's details, and without any records of what? His mother's, uh, her father's details. Which seems to suggest that there was a possibility that he had a father and he had a mother, but they did not record his father and mother's what? Name. Now, he won't be the first person who doesn't have a genealogy in the Bible. There are people in the Bible who don't have a genealogy. They just, they just there. Because their genealogy did not matter to the work and the plan of what? Salvation. And so it is not, it, it is not mysterious to have that. But in the Levitical order, you cannot be a priest in the order of the Levites, if your um, ancestry cannot be proved, you will not be allowed to become a priest if your ancestry cannot be what? Cannot be proved. Now, there are unique things about Melchizedek's um, priesthood and kingship that mirrors that of Christ too. Number one, 
his his life is um his scope of interaction was known to be universal number two he was a royalty he was a king number three he was righteous number four he was peace he was a king of what peace number five his throne was meant to be unending all of that christ jesus also fulfilled the same the same thing now i wanted to read verse four now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriot abraham gave the tenth of the spoils verse five and verily they that are of the sons of levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren though they come out of the loins of abraham that is very interesting that is very interesting the bible is saying that abraham gave tithes to melchizedek and when you compare that to the levitical priesthood the levites were supposed to receive tithes of their brethren because the levites were not supposed to work they were supposed to a full-time ministry they're in full-time ministry and the tithes were supposed to look after them and look after their knees and everything now when you study the law you will notice that the levites received tithes but when they received tithes they were also supposed to give a tithe of a tithe because they were the children of god first before priesthood they were supposed to do that now interestingly as Abraham gave tithes, the proceeds of the tithes he gave went way down to the fourth generation. Because the Bible makes us to understand that Abraham begat what? Isaac. Then Isaac begat what? Jacob. Then Jacob begat what? Levi. And it is out of Levi we get what? The Levites. And it is out of the Levites we get what? Aaron and it is from Aaron we get sons of Aaron and it's from the sons of Aaron we get what the high priest and all the priesthoods and so when you are given to the work of God and to the things of God stop thinking only about yourself because the giving that we do to support the work of God goes way down to the fourth generation to the fourth generation. Abraham gave tithes when his own son Isaac was not born. But the Bible says because he gave tithes and Levi was in his loins, in the realms of the spirit, Levi was in his loins, he received of that. Now, there is a great man of God that preached a message called sinners in the hands of an angry God. And this man, while he was preaching, the Spirit of God captivated the whole church and people were holding on to pillars, crying out because they felt the conviction that they were sinking, literally sinking to hell. And we began to cry out. Began to cry out. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Many years ago, because of the consecration and the love and the amount and his life is spent in the kingdom. Many of U.S. leaders, in fact, some of his descendants became vice president. Because God never heard, forgets. He never forgets. And so the blessings goes through. For example, if you go to London and you see people begging on the streets, you don't find Jewish people begging on the street. Because the blessing of Abraham is still what? Uh, still speaking now london um council is fond of putting yellow lines double yellow lines cannot park here at this time to this time and cannot park here at all at any time red lines but if you go into jewish communities there's not even a yellow line there you can park anywhere you want what what's the mystery because covenants god is a covenant keeping god and whatever their hand touches becomes war. Well, blessed. It is that understanding we as Christians must have. 
Because we too are a branch of Abraham. But how do they get into that? By covenant again. And that is why the teaching and the understanding and the revelation of covenants is a necessity. Especially in the times in which we are. Because that's how Abraham lived. That's how Isaac lived. That's how Jacob lived. They lived before the law. And angels were coming and giving them directions concerning their business, concerning their lives and everything. And that's the kind of life we believe that if we trust him, we will have in the name of Jesus. Next verse. Verse 6. But he whose descendant is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. When, when the Bible says the less is blessed of the better, what it's saying is um, Abraham was, was of a lesser person to what? Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was blessed him. That's what he's explaining. It's just King James English. Verse 8. And here men die, here, sorry, and here men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. Read it in the Amplified Classic Version. Furthermore, here in the Levitical priesthood, tithes are received by men who are subject to death. While there, in the case of Melchizedek, they are received by one of whom it is testified that he lives perpetually. Now, that is very clear. What he's saying is... And the Levitical order, you're giving tithes to a priest that is going to die. So that priest, you give him the tithes, he will die and go. But in the, in the order of the Melchizedek, your giving is never wasted because the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek, which is the priesthood of Christ Jesus, it never dies. So whatever you have given, God will diligently also bless you with. Next verse. Verse 9, and as I may say so, and as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, that tells you, and the lesson we can learn from that is, those of you that are younger, please listen to me. You could start giving an offering even before your children are born. It's a mystery. I wish somebody had taught me this when I was a teenager. But you see, revelation, sometimes we don't get revelation in the right time. If any one of you that is young will begin to make, say, now, in the same way somebody can put money aside in the bank account, right? For his child. Or when my child grows up and I'm putting this money in the savings account for my child. And everything, you could do the same thing in the realms of the spirit. And God will remember that child for good. Because, and it does not just go to your very immediate child. It goes down to the fourth world generation. And that's why the Bible makes us to understand that our labor will never be what? It will never be in vain. It's a principle of the way of the spirit. That's why I gave an assignment. I said, if you don't understand these things, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand. Because it doesn't matter how much we try to explain it. Without the spirit of God, you will not understand clearly. Next verse. Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay, now he's making a comparison. And the comparison he's saying is, when the Levitical priesthood was, was, um, was established, it was the establishment of the Levitical priesthood that necessitated that there should also be the law. Without a Levitical priesthood system, 
There was no need for what? The law. The two go hand in hand. And so when Jesus came by the order of Melchizedek and he died on the cross and he fulfilled the law and the prophets, what happened was the Levitical system was what? Suspended. It was of no more of any necessity because the order of Melchizedek, the Christ is of, was a better priesthood than that of the Levitical what? priesthood. I repeat. The Levitical priesthood goes hand in hand with Levitical law. When Jesus came, he said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. And when Jesus died and resurrected, he fulfilled the law and the prophets. Having fulfilled the law and the prophets, the Levitical order is not necessary anymore because what was the Levitical order about? It was about animal sacrifice, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the burnt offering, the uh, meal offering, and all kinds of offering, and, the, and then the shedding of blood and everything. And then the priests have to pick the animal and then transfer the sins of the people upon the animal and then release the um, escape goat into the world. And all of that, Jesus paid the price in fullness at Calvary. Having paid the price in fullness of Calvary, it makes the Levitical um, priesthood of, of no what necessity anymore. Because a better priesthood, where in this better priesthood, Christ himself has become our Passover lamb, has become our sin offering, has become our trespass offering. For the Bible says that the Father has laid the iniquity of us all on him. Just the same way on the day of atonement, the high priest lays his hands upon the goat and transfers the iniquity of the whole nation and whole people upon them. That's the same thing. And so there was no need for that anymore. Why did Paul have to write this? Because many of the early believers who were Jew, of a Jewish origin were getting tempted to going back to the Levit Levitical one systems again. And they were thinking about mm, maybe the salvation through Christ is not enough. Let's go and buy a ram. It's not enough. Let's go and get a goat. It's not enough. Let us go and get a heifer. That's why we learn in chapter 6 that by going back to that system, you make Christ's wounds what? Fresh. And you deny the very existence and plan of salvation. And so Paul is explaining to them that as much as they reverent the Levitical system, there's a better priesthood that is way better than Levitical system. Read the next verse. Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Now, that, that, that's to say, because the Levitical system, it, was, it wasn't a perfect system. This is a system whereby the high priest have to bring a sacrifice for his own heart, sins. We have another high priest who doesn't have to sacrifice for his own horn. He doesn't have to sacrifice for his own sins. He, has, he is the mediator between man and God. He is the all in all. Now, let me explain a little bit about the law. Because many times people say, well, we don't live under law. We don't live under law. We don't live under law. What is the law? Because many of these talk is sometimes it's just talk with no explanation whatsoever. So let's go back to scripture. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 26. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith is come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Excellent. The Bible says that the law is a schoolmaster, which led us to Christ. What does that mean? Now, 
when you read the Ten Commandments, and by the time you get to the tenth one, you realize that you haven't fulfilled any one of them in fullness. And so you realize that you are guilty as what? Charged. The law makes you to see that you don't have the righteousness God is demanding for. And then when the law shows you that you don't have that righteousness, then the law passes on. The job of the law is to expose you and expose your sinful nature. But the law itself cannot save you. It's just a schoolmaster. It takes you to the place of examination. But you have to pass the exams. And just when you're about to take the exams, somebody shows up and says, well, my name is Christ. I am here to take the examination for you so that you can pass. That's the amazing thing about what? Salvation. So the law in itself cannot save. There will meet religious people that say that, well, I, I, I try my best. I keep the Ten Commandments. That can't save you. Because the Ten Commandments expanded is Matthew chapter 5 up to Matthew chapter 7. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Ten Commandments expanded, you will realize how difficult it is to keep what? The Ten Commandments. But Christ Jesus paid the price that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. You cannot justify yourself by saying, I'm keeping the commandments. It's not possible. Now, for example, most people think the law is 10 commandments. No, there are about more than 600 laws in the Old Testament alone that you're supposed to obey under the Levitical law, 600. The problem is you don't even remember 300 to even keep I'm just being very um, dividing it. 600 laws. How many of them would you remember to keep? And so Christ has to come to die on the cross for us. That's the amazing thing about salvation. So don't try to go back to the Levitical law. You cannot keep the Levitical law. Now, I'll give you another scripture. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Ah, so the Bible says God knew the law could not what? Bring us salvation. So he sent his only begotten son to pay the price of the penalty of sin on our behalf that we might be saved. Amazing love. It's, it's an amazing, amazing love. Read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Because Moses only prophesied kingship concerning the tribe of what? Judah. And Moses' prophecy was, the scepter shall not depart from what? Judah. Now, the king's scepter. So, the tribe of Judah was true. The tribe of Judah that the kings were, be, were to be born. But not um, nothing to do with the Levites. Moses himself was a Levite. Moses was a Levite. His um, brother and sister, they were all Levites. They were from the tribe of Levites. But Moses, as a prophet, knew that the king Messiah that is coming will come through the tribe of what? The tribe of Judah. And so he knew that a better priesthood was on the way coming. A better priesthood, and that's the priesthood of Christ Jesus. Next verse. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, 
there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Yes, go on, verse 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, there we go again. Paul is quoting Bible. He said, thou art a priest forever after the order of what? Melchizedek. Where is he getting that from? Psalm 110, verse 4. Now, that's why what I try to teach. That if you're going to be a good preacher, always reference everything by what? By scripture. Because that is what the apostles did. That's what the prophets did. They always searched the scriptures and referred it back to the word of God. He quoted from Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Huh. That's a very deep scripture that I don't have time to explain. But I'll say a little of it. When God, what I'm, wait, when he say God has sworn and will not repent. That means God has sworn and will not change his mind that I have called you to the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. That is why Jonah will run, but they called to run after him. And God did not give you up on Jonah. You, if God set his eyes on you to do his work, and you decide that you will not do it, your life will be miserable. Go and ask um, Prophet Jonah. Anybody that have tried it, well, his life is so much trouble. I have come across people that know they have a call of God upon their life, and they fought God and decided not to answer the call. Their, life is, their lives are miserable. Don't even try it. Because for some reason, when God sets his eyes on a man to serve him, he doesn't give up. He doesn't give up. You might mess up. He won't give up. It's up to you to get back and get in line. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 18 and 19. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. The law made nothing what? Perfect. perfect. The law itself was perfect, but it could not make anything what? Perfect. And so a better covenant had to be brought in through who? Through Christ Jesus. So you cannot be perfect by law. You are saved by grace through faith. Now, I want to explain the concept of the law. When you read in the Bible and come across the law, the law, the law, what's the Bible actually talking about? There are three concepts. There are three codes of the law. Number one, that's what is called the moral law. Number two, that's why it's called a ceremonial law. And number three, that's why it's called a judicial law. And Christians call all of it what? Law. I'm going to break it down because when we get in the New Testament and we say we live in the time of grace or live in the days of grace and we don't have to follow the law, as much as that is truth, we need to know what aspects of the law are we not supposed to what? follow. What aspects of the law are still applicable to our Christian life? Number one, I'll take the first one, the moral law. The moral law, which is called um, mishpatim in Hebrew, relates to justice and judgment, ordinances that helps you to live morally. So, for example, you go to Leviticus chapter 18 and 19, it will list all kinds of laws. You're not supposed to lie down with, with um, your father, uh, father's wife, your mother's um, husband, all kinds of things. Your sister, it, the list is long. In Leviticus 18 and 19, those are moral laws. They still exist. Now, I'm quite aware that in some countries, you could even marry your first cousin. Your first cousin, yes. But then scripturally, 
in under the Levitical law, that, that was not allowed anymore. It wasn't allowed anymore. In the beginning it was because there was a higher gene pool. And medicine, modern medicine has told us that marrying of cousins weakens the gene pool. And so um, the gener degenerative um, diseases comes hereditary disease on all of what is big words? Hereditary diseases oh, and everything comes in the lineage. Now, for example, the European royal family. When I say the European royal family, the British royal family, the Norwegian royal family, the Danish royal family, the, um, the Dutch royal family, the French royal family, um, the Russian royal family, until they were killed, and until the French royal family were overthrown, all those royal families across the continent of Europe are related. They're cousins. They are all related. And so when you study um, genetics, one of the topics you have to do is you have to study um, the royal families across Europe and you realize that certain diseases is always among them because they married their what? Their cousins. Including the Queen Elizabeth of England. They are all married. It's, it's, it's a close-knit thing. That is why by the time you get to Prince Charles and um, Diana comes from outside in, it wasn't easy for them to accept what outsiders because the whole thing had been a close-knit family. Uh, it's a close-knit family. So royalty stays royalty. Money stays in. Wealth stays in. It doesn't go anywhere. So if you're an outsider coming into the family, you're going to have a hard time. But then, for example, in Australia, you can marry your first cousin. Why am I giving these details before people fly over there? Let me stop. There are about more than 10 countries you could do that. And it's not illegal. In one of the countries, you could even marry your uncle, your niece. This so-called um, developed, in Australia, you could marry, okay, I've mentioned Australia, so let me go. You can marry your uncle, your niece, and it is legal. It is legal. You can do it. Abomination is legal. Can you imagine that? It's, it's unbelievable. And when I found out while I was studying, I was shocked because I didn't know that some of these so-called developed countries allows these kinds of things to go. And then they look down upon the rest of the world as, as um, undeveloped. Very sad. So moral law exists so that we will exhibit boundaries. Amen? So that in the New Testament, though we are saved by grace, true faith, we still need to live by moral heart, the moral code of the law. Jesus has fulfilled the law, but we need to live by the moral code. We cannot say that we're now born again, and because we're born again, our past sins are under the blood, present sins under the blood, future sins under the blood, and so we can do whatever we like, and the blood is still flowing. You'll be shocked on the day of reckoning. We got to stay in the confinement of scripture. This is why the apostle Paul again had to write to the believers in Rome because the believers in Rome were beginning to believe in one saved, forever saved, and we could do anything what we like. Go to Romans chapter 6, read from verse 1. Romans chapter 6 from verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Jump to verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. You see, so the Apostle Paul had to write to the early church and correct 
the notion of the grace movement that has shown up again in these last days again, telling people you could do whatever you like and everything is under the blood. It doesn't matter whatever you do. Everything is under the blood. I'm afraid to come and tell you it is not so. That Paul the Apostle, the Apostle to the Gentiles, wrote a letter to the Hebrews, wrote a letter to the Galatians, wrote a letter to the Corinthians, and wrote a letter to the Romans, and said, let me be clear to you. Yes, we live in the time of grace, and we are saved by grace through faith, but it doesn't give us the license to live in sin and commit sin what? Anytime we want and anywhere, whatever we want to do. That's not what the grace of God is. So Paul and Asher wrote to his son, um, his son um, Titus in Titus chapter 2. Go to Titus chapter 2 verse 11 because then he had to explain what grace actually means so that the people will not abuse the aspect of grace. For Titus the, chapter 2 from 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Have appeared to all men. To, has appeared unto all men. Teaching us. Teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That the first thing the grace of God does is. It teaches you to deny what? Ungodliness and what? And worldly lust. Next. We should live soberly. Righteously. Hold on. That after the grace of God have taught you. To deny ungodliness and worldly lust. It also teaches you. It doesn't teach you to live to run away from negativity it teaches you how to live positively for christ teaching us to do what live soberly live soberly righteously now you can't live soberly when you're drinking vodka you cannot live soberly when you are you, 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 you are drink you are, you, you are smoking some weed you cannot drink, um, be sober when you're sniffing some cocaine and some heroin you can't live sober you will start seeing rats that are riding horses you will see elephants that are riding four wheel drive. You will see, you'll start hallucinating. And so that's not living soberly. Okay. Before you come and say that God planted everything and everything was planted and the Lord said it was good. It was, he said it was good for the purpose for which it was created. Not to abuse it. Keep reading. Righteously and godly. Now we're supposed to live righteously and godly. Continue. In, in this present world. Oh, not in the past world. In this present difficult times in which we live, his disgrace is sufficient. The Bible says, where sin abounds, the grace of God even abounds what? More. So as we live in, in the last days where the sin is on the increase, I want to tell you, as sin is on the increase, as unrighteousness is on the increase, so is the grace of God also what? In, on the increase to establish us and to give us the strength to stand. We are the generation that are supposed to stand and bring glory to God. Keep reading. Looking for that blessed hope. Now, after we've done all of that, laying aside every sin, laying aside your ungodliness, and living and soberly and righteously, the next thing the grace of God enables you to do is to have a focus of eternity. The grace of God is to help you to ascertain the eternity. Looking for what? That blessed hope and the glorious appearing. So that's what the grace of God does. Now you'll come across believers that have no, that have no interest in the coming of the Lord. That is not supposed to be. The grace of God is meant to awaken you up to be watchful and know that he can come at any time. Keep reading. And our Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Now, the whole purpose of Jesus dying on the cross was to make grace available for us to live soberly and righteously in this present world and then looking for that blessed hope. Why? Keep reading. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So the whole idea is to bring us into perfection. 
not into more sin, but to bring us into so grace. Grace takes you from one level to another level to another level in God. Grace is supposed to enable you to become more like Christ, not less like Christ. It's, now, that has got to do with the moral law. Everything I've said now is on the moral law. Now, let me move to the second aspect of the law. It's called the ceremonial law. Now, ceremonial law covers things like... Um, like a woman, when a woman has his menstrual cycle, um, he's not supposed to come into public and interact with the public. You read Leviticus, you see a lot of those things. Those are ceremonial laws. For example, you need to be circumcised on the eighth day. All men who have to be what? Circumcised. Those are ceremonial laws. They've got nothing to do with salvation. They have nothing to do with what? Salvation. And so, in the New Testament, ceremonial laws are of no benefit to you regarding salvation. I repeat, ceremonial laws are of no benefit to you regarding what? Salvation. Now, for example, there was a law that um, men should not wear, that um, women what? wear, and every, no cross-dressing. And there were laws concerning... Um, the food, dietary laws. Don't eat this animal, eat that animal. Don't eat that animal, eat that animal. But then when you get to the New Testament, Paul said that everything you can sanctify it right and you can what? By prayer and what? And eat it. Now, people have misquoted that scripture. What Paul meant was in the ceremonial law, if you eat these animals, you are disobeying the law, and so it was what? Sin. Under the New Testament, if you eat that animal, it is not sin. Because if you offer it with prayer, you have not committed what? Sin. Okay? It's not a sin to eat those animals. However, careful study of the word of God and medical science is now backing that up. The many of the dietary laws God gave to them in the book of Leviticus, were not necessarily just laws to punish them, but for their help. Because they're now finding that the animals God told the children of Israel not to eat, most of them are bottom feeders. You see, we live in a time we think if you, if you, what's that big one of prawns? Prawns, big brother, what's he called? Not shrimps. Prawns, shrimps, and what's the big one? Lobster. Now, last one looks like a cockroach. Now, a cockroach is a bottom feeder. But you see, brainwashing and philosophies and human ideas and intellectualism have brainwashed us to thinking that when you eat lobster, you're posh and you are very rich. But in reality, lobsters were created to clean the sea. So all the dead materials in the sea, the lobsters, the prawns, and the shrimps, that's their job. They, they, they are the garbage truck of the sea. They clean the sea from all the chemicals and the, the bad things and all the things, the free radicals that should not be going into your body. They are supposed to be eating it because your body can break them down. But you're not supposed to eat them. But modernity says that when you got a lobster on your plate, you can cross your leg with a glass of wine and that makes you special. Well, it's just, a, it's just a dignified cockroach. That's all it is. It's just a dignified cockroach. There's no difference. The cockroaches are the land what? The cockroaches and um, what's the other one? Um, ah, what have I forgotten? It's a beetle. It's called a rhinoceros beetle. But what it does is once it sees pools around, it will go around it and it will eat the pool. His job is to clean the earth. Not to leave any poo around. He is he's the poo eliminator. That's his job. Look at the vulture. Well, the vulture, the structure of the vulture and everything, it looks like chicken, but he's not chicken because he's been given certain chemicals in his digestive system that is to eat dead materials of high bacteria and decomposing materials. So you're not supposed to eat that. So all the animals got the pig. The pig. What does the pig eat? Anything you throw at it. 
anything. It is anything. The pig is another cabbage truck. But then modernity says that no pigtails, sausages. If, if I, the way we pronounce it, if it makes it sausages, hot dogs, bulldog, bulldog, hot dog, whatever. They are scavengers. And the scavengers um, have a lot of free radicals that causes cancer in their body. It's not good for us. But if you eat it, it will not take you to hell. Am I clear? It will not reduce your being born again. It's just that we might, bury, we, might bury, we might bury you early. We might bury you early. If you keep eating those things, it will affect your health. And we will say dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And so those are the ceremonial laws. For example, circumcision. Circumcision does not make you holy. It does not increase anything. However, science have also now discovered that circumcised people, circumcised men, don't, don't stand the risk of having infections in their sack because there is no sack anymore. And so they have health benefits of these ceremonial laws, but they are not binding on the Christian. Am I very clear? The third law. The third law is judicial. The judicial law was part of the law package to settle scores between people in a civil matter, in a criminal matter, who Moses and Aaron had to deal with all those kinds of things. Now, if you go to Exodus chapter 21, verse 12 to 36, it will talk about, I'm not going to read that, it will talk about um, people restituting for their ox and donkeys falling into the people's holes and all kinds of things that if you, when you get time, go and read it. They are, they are judicial law. And do you know the funny thing? We adopted many of them into our constitutional laws. Most people don't even know. So when you have humanists sitting there and saying, well, I don't agree with this, I don't agree. They don't even know where the law was picked out from. Most of them is from the judicial law of the Old Testament that have kept society together because it has the presence of God on it. Let me show you one of them. Go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 and 34. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 and 4. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It is by this law, God told the children of Israel that if a foreigner comes to dwell among you, he doesn't give any trouble, he's not involved in crime, he's been living among you, begin to treat that person as one of what? One of you. It is by this law, they enacted the law that when a child is born in a country, that his parents were not born there, but the child was born there, that child becomes a citizen of what? Of that nation. It is by this law. It's judicial. They brought it in so that it will protect foreigners. That is why your parents might not be British, but if you're born in Britain, you're British. Your parents might not be Barbadians, but if you're born in Barbados, you are Barbadian. They give you a Barbadian ID card and they give you a Barbadian passport and everything and things like that. That is coming from this law. So yes, Jesus has fulfilled the law and everything, but do you still see that the aspects of the law are still implemented in our societies to keep society world together? So the law is not a bad thing in its reality. So let's just stop saying the law, the law, the law without understanding what the law was all about. Because some of us, had it not been this law, you will live in a nation for a very long time and they won't give you any rights what, whatsoever. And that is wrong. That is wrong. The next time you open your mouth and say, all these Guyanese must go back to their country when they've been born here, when they've married here, know and understand you're breaking the law. Because God does not like that. He likes that we treat foreigners the same way when you go to America and you want America to treat you nice, 
It's the same way when foreigners come here, you need to treat them like it's a golden rule of God. And it was adopted from the Bible, put in the constitution to protect minorities. Now, let's move on. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20 and 21. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that saith unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Now, I want you to go to the Amplified Classic Version because that will expand that verse very clearly. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. In keeping with the oaths, greater strength and force, Jesus has become the guarantee for a better, stronger agreement, a more excellent and more advantageous covenant. A more excellent and advantageous covenant. Jesus is a surety of a better testament. Jesus has given us the opportunity to have the fullness of God's plan for humanity. That is what he's talking about. Go to 23 to 26. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Thank you. Now, notice that this high priest is an excellent high priest, Christ Jesus. He has paid the price for us. And the Bible says many priests under the Levitical laws have come and gone. They're dead and gone. But this high priest, Christ Jesus, is on the right hand side of God, praying and interceding for me and interceding for you that he will bring you to an expected end in Jesus' name. Now, history tells us that there have been about 84 um, high priests from Aaron to when the temple was destroyed that served in that Levitical order. Now, if the temple had not been destroyed, we would have had more, what? more high priests. But there cannot be a high priest without what? Without a temple. And so the order of the high priest has to cease. And they had to have only synagogues. God, in his wisdom, allowed that to happen. So that the eyes of people will focus on what? One who? One high priest. One high priest. Now, verse 27. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was sent to the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Hebrews 7, 27. Verse 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did want when he offered up himself. Now, the Bible says that Christ Jesus doesn't have to make sacrifice for his own sins. Which gives him a clear conscience which gives him more time to even what? Pray for us. Now I'll give you this assignment. What is Jesus praying for us about? Go and study John chapter 17 and you'll find what Jesus is interceding for us about. He sits on the right hand side of God and this is what he prays for us. This is what he prayed for us in Garden of Gethsemane. This is what he prays for us on the right hand side of God. John chapter 17 is the prayer of the high priest. The prayer and intercession of the high priest. Lastly, I wanted to read this scripture. 
Now, before we read that scripture, let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Christ on the right hand side of God is making what? Intercession for us. He's praying for us and we'll stand to the very end. Read Hebrews 7, 28. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was sent the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. The son who is consecrated forevermore is our high priest by the word of oath. What does the son do for us? How does Jesus defend us in the court of heaven? Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now you see that. So, Paul did not encourage the Christians to continue in sin. John did not encourage the believers to what? Continue in sin. But then they explained. However, if you fall into sin, we have an advocate, we have a lawyer, we have an intercessor, we have a high priest who pleads on our behalf with the Father that there will be what? Reconciliation and restoration. That is the beauty of the gospel. And so when we go to the Old Testament and we apply scriptures to our lives in this time and this age, we have to understand that we are applying those scriptures only by a matter of um, a, prince, um, a spiritual principle, not as a means of the law. Because the problem with preaching is when somebody says that, oh, you should not be eating this, that's it. We make a law out of what? That thing. Now, there are food that even affects now um, your frequency of hearing God. Your hearing capacity. Now there are three types of hearing. The physical hearing, your inner hearing, your spiritual hearing. There are food that makes you dull. Have you read the scripture where it says that if you eat honey, you'll be wise? So food is connected to even your spiritual upliftment and everything. And take time. Pick up. It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. Just take time, study it, and dig it out. You will see there are food that help you spiritually. Yes, it is in the Bible. That wakes you up. That makes you more sensitive. And there are the ones that makes you dull. Makes you dull. You just go to bed and, and just yawn and sleep and find yourself in the market and from the market You'll find yourself in your child's classroom talking to the teacher and from there, you'll be in the supermarket. You're all over the place. Meaningless dreams. And so all of these things, we need to come to understanding and make us and study them, know them for ourselves. Some of these things, it is better for you to discover it yourselves than somebody to teach you about them. Before you, before you go and misquote and say that the person is saying that and this food is spiritual, so you eat, you grow spiritually. That's not what we are saying. We are saying that there are certain things God has put in the Bible that you need to search. What are the importance and the benefits of them? And not take them as a means of law, but take them on health values for yourself. And God will richly bless you. I want you to lift up your voice and begin to talk to the Lord in prayer. Lift up your voice and begin to talk to the Lord in prayer. I say, Lord, help me. Help me to understand the role of Christ as a priest in my life. Help me to understand the role of Christ in my life in the way and manner I apply scriptures to my very being that your name will be glorified in my life. Lift up your voice and pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. And we ask the Lord, your word will be written on the tablets of our hearts that we will never be the same again. That we will understand the role that when we come to, we come to prayer and we assess the courts of heaven, we will understand your role as an intercessor for us in the courts of heaven. And use the scriptures to fight and to win the battles of life. That your name will be glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.